Good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this morning's program. And we are here uh, with Ryan Jacob uh, for the program, The Place to Be, Ohio's Birding Network. And it's a live broadcast. Um, so good morning, Ryan. I know that you are broadcasting live from Omni Bay State Park. Um, and uh, Ryan Jacob is a staff ornithologist at Black Swamp Bird Observatory. Um, and I want to just give a quick reminder to everyone um, to please mute your microphone. Um, if you have a question, I'm sure that you can ans ask it and um, Ryan will be happy to answer. But let me just read you the description for th this morning's program before we start. So incorporating the elements from WCAS's recent fall warbler review, which was a beautiful program that Ryan presented last week, and uh, you can watch that uh, recorded version of it on our website, wcaudubon.org. So Ryan will record this morning live from Maumee State uh, Bay State Park. And that is a personal favorite for fall migration of his in Northwest Ohio. So with fall migration progressing and WCAS's fall warbler challenge in full swing, Ryan, this morning, will discuss fall warbler ID tips, which warblers and migrants we can expect to see, and when, and the holistic nature of migration. So, and please don't forget to register for the WCAS Fall Warbler Challenge. Well, good morning, Ryan. Please take it away. Good morning, Betsy. You hear me just fine? Yes. Awesome. So I am out in Mommy Bay State Park this morning. Um, welcome, everybody. I kind of figured, you know, being in Northwest Ohio, everybody knows McGee Marsh Wildlife Area, and, you know, that's the hotbed for warbler activity. But for me personally, um, I'm a fan of Mommy Bay State Park. I kind of got my come, come up in here as a naturalist getting into the field of um, environmental studies and just interpretation. So I really like this area. And just a little history, um, I know a lot of people travel over here, especially in spring, but for fall, not so many, but some of the history of the area, you know, this all used to be great black swamp habitat. And when early settlers started arriving in this area, you know, they really wanted to get at this soil because it was very rich soil. And Laws were passed to help drain it. You know, there's a lot of history with that. But the whole area pretty much was drained uh, and logged to make this into farmland. So a lot of this area was former farmland. Maumee Bay in particular was purchased in the 70s and became a state park. And it used to actually, the beach was Niles Beach and used to be a cottage area. And a storm took out a lot of those cottages. And... They just incorporated it into the state park and just protected it as beach habitat uh, for any number of wading birds, shorebirds, uh, other water birds, terns in particular, uh, to use those, those sandy areas. But I really like this area. If you've never been, it's a great place to stop if you're coming over here during spring migration. Uh, in particular, I'm on the horse trail, which a lot of people may not know. It's right at the entrance of the park. Um, one, it was the only place I could think of where there might not be people, so I could kind of be alone for this and social distance. Um, but it's a cool, it's a two-mile trail that kind of goes through a great prairie scrub shrub area, and there's some spots where there could be waders and ducks, and it kind of gets into a little bit of a forest, um, and then lots of intermixed prairie forest scrub area. So it's, it's a cool spot. I really like it and it's very serene and quiet. Um, unfortunately today, you know, we planned a week ahead of time what day we were going to do, and I was like, oh, Thursday looks like a great day to be out and look for birds, and of course today it's cloudy, windy, cold, and that's just the way our luck goes. But I'm still out here, 
uh, looking and listening for anything I may see. And I kind of figured, I saw some of the other video, great videos that Western Cuyahoga has done, and I kind of figured, let's get out and actually kind of walk around, look around. I know a lot of people can be confined to their houses right now or confined to certain areas and maybe just can't get out uh, like they would like to. So I wanted to get out, try to find some birds, and talk a little bit about what we're seeing, migration, warblers that are coming through, and just sort of have a, a fun morning outside, even if it is 60 and kind of windy and gray, but it's still great to be out regardless. Um, if there's any questions at any time, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, and, you know, I like having conversations and just going with things on the fly. So anytime anybody has anything they want to add or suggest, question, just go for it. So just to give you an idea, ooh, peewee just flew by. Flip around here. Give you an idea of the habitat I'm looking at. So this is a pretty wide trail, and there's a good little mix of maples and bur oaks and cottonwoods, nice tall trees, but then there's this great sort of understory. So incorporating the fall warbler challenge that's going on right now, um, I don't know the habitats over there quite as well, but anytime you can find good spots that have decent overstory, canopy upper story there, um, with intermixed low scrubby stuff, especially dogwoods. And there's a shot of our dogwood berries. Um, warblers right now in particular, but thrushes and vireos too, are finding these more forested habitats that have this nice understory. And they're getting down there, they're eating a lot of insects, but you know, cold days like this, insects are gonna start disappearing fairly soon. And they're getting down in these habitats, looking for berries, uh, dogwoods, grapes, um, poison ivy sometimes, honeysuckle if they have to, hackberries, things like that. And trying to build on that fat as they're migrating south. So if you can kind of find these intermixed habitats or edge habitats where you might have a good stand of forest, as we're kind of walking up to now, but then it leads into either marshy stuff or just scrubby field with lots of tall shrubbery. Uh, those are going to be good spots to find, particularly warblers, but to find thrushes and vireos, rose-breasteds tend to gross beaks, tend to like to be in the forest a little bit more and hang out in the canopy, but you can get them down in some of these lower levels as well. So I haven't heard since I've been walking here for about a half an hour already, haven't heard too many warblers like I was hoping for. Um, I have had peewee, eastern wood peewee, least flycatcher, and lots of swains and thrushes beeping around making their little wheat noises. But it's still a fairly early morning. And you never know where the birds actually might be hanging out. Oh. I don't know if we could get those grackles flying overhead. So to get into migrational timing right now, again, with the fall warbler challenge, yesterday, at least in northwest Ohio, and I don't imagine it's too much different in northeast, um, Maybe for black poles, it might be a day later or so. But we really, just this past week, started getting our bigger influxes of migrant warblers coming through and diversity definitely rising. And that's typical for about the third, second and third week of September. I think September has five weeks this year. But right around the 15th, 16th, is when a good number of warblers start coming into the area. And 
a lot of the early sorry heard a blue jay just making sure it was just a blue jay um, a lot of the early migrants are kind of already gone prothonotary yellow warbler mornings are somewhat early Canada warblers kind of at their tail end by now but we still have a lot of other migrants yet to come and coming right now including uh, black and white warbler, black throated green, black throated blue, chestnut sided um, common yellow throats will be moving pretty much until mid-October um, and then black poles and bay breasts have really started kicking off right now I know yesterday when I was out doing our point counts for Black Swamp Bird Observatory and if we were able to be banding birds at the moment I think we would have probably had a hundred black pole day and with Nancy listening she knows exactly what that means. It's a it's a fast day of lots of black poles moving around. So it's definitely starting to kick off right now and I would expect if you get out into these good scrubby areas mixed with forest, um, you should start seeing a lot of warblers. I'm just kinda listening as I go especially in fall knowing the sounds of birds is crucial to identifying or even finding ooh, oh, just took off Swainson's thrush and especially thrushes right now I mean compared to spring there's a lot more leaves right now and they're gonna be on the trees for a good another I mean, with this little cold snap now, they're starting to come off. Some of the sycamores are turning brown. The cottonwoods are yellowing. But we've got a good another couple weeks, month of lots of vegetation. And thrushes just hang out in that, and they're almost impossible to see. So really learning thrushes' sounds, uh, especially Swainson's, very gray cheek. Uh, hermits can be a little bit easier once they move in, since it's later um, into October and there won't be as much leaves everywhere. They're easier to see, but learning the other three brown thrushes, uh, their sounds can be very helpful when you're out in the field. And there's just some cardinals making their little noises. That's one I find can confuse a lot with warblers because it's just kind of a tinkly little sound um, but it tends to be more repeated it has a sharper sound to it than a warbler chip does so that's a good one to, to learn I almost kind of picture I don't know why but little diamonds falling on a tin plate with cardinals just this high-pitched tink and warblers just seem to have more substance to their calls So as part of the identification, um, getting to the confusing warblers that everybody fears. Well, Cardinal's starting to call, I was hoping. I did just hear a warbler chip. It sounded more black poly. Um, to my ears, it has sort of this flat, almost metallic, uh, nature to their chip. It's just but of course I can't see it with the, the leaves blowing all over the place. Um, but getting into the confusing warblers, uh, I know that everybody gets flustered by, and especially now that Black Pole and Bay Breast, the two probably epitome of confusing warblers are moving in, learning their little differences is I won't, I won't say it's crucial but it's it definitely helps when you're in the field and you're trying to decide is that a black pole is that a bay breast is it just a bay pole and sometimes bay pole is the appropriate answer you just don't see enough of it and you have to go that's just the bay pole warbler catbird calling off in the understory here but when we're looking at black poles and bay breasts, 
up in the trees, um, first thing that we generally can see, especially if we're looking up, is just leg and foot color. Uh, bay breasts tend to have paler, almost blue, like a vireo, but a little duskier than that. Legs and feet, and black poles tend to have a brownish leg, or tarsus, really, um, with yellowy sort of feet, orangey yellow foot pads. This doesn't always hold up, but it's one of those first things you can look at to start to decide and piece together, okay, is this a black pole or is this a bay breast? Then from there, you can kind of, again, if we're thinking of just looking up under the bird, which tends to happen a lot, looking at the belly color and some of the breast markings on those birds, uh, black pole tends to be whitish underneath, particularly on the belly, and then getting into this yellow wash. Uh, upper belly, to mid, mid breast, but going into the breast, into the throat, with little streaks kind of all over the place, uh, making it kind of dusky, giving it a dirty look. Whereas bay breast, I think a blue jay might have found an owl. Oh, I don't know where they're going. They might just be being rambunctious like blue jays do. Uh, but bay breast, kind of light underneath, but as you get towards the undertail covert, the vent area, kind of has this creamy color with it. So, and the yellow from the breast doesn't quite go down as far as a black pole would go. So it has sort of this clean water, in my eyes, watercolory look underneath. It's just very smooth, clean transitions between everything. And of course, if we could see the top of the bird, then we can start to look at the face, look at the head colors, look at the back colors, and any streaking there, bay breast having sort of this Green, more green yellow head that again is kind of a smooth color, not too many streaks in it. Where black pole is more of an olivey, duskier green yellow color with hints of streaks, uh, sometimes in the face and crown, and especially more so in the back. up in the air doing their Canada thing. So again, thinking of the timing of migration right now, Robin, American Robin. Not that there would be any other Robin, but I figure I should say the whole name. Um, thinking of the timing of migration right now, we're definitely in warbler time and you know, that's obviously one of people's favorites. Everybody loves warblers, but there's plenty of other songbirds moving right now. Um, Flycatchers are another one that we don't really think about. We think of them maybe as an earlier migrant, and that holds true for the willow and alder flycatchers. But peewees, yellow bellies, and leaf flycatchers are really moving a, a good amount through September. And you can see a lot of them, if you get to good migrant traps along the lake or maybe a little farther inland, uh, see a lot of those in Pitanax and Peewee flycatchers. And Phoebe, of course, being a short-distance migrant, can kind of go throughout all of spring and, or not spring, fall, excuse me, September, October migration. But then we also have rose-breasted grosbeaks. They're making heavy movements in the middle of September right now into the next week they should be moving pretty heavily vireos are another one there have been a ton of vireos in the region I don't know about Cleveland area I would assume so as well um, I know our friends at powder mill uh, research station banding research station in Pennsylvania they are having so many red-eyed vireos this fall, and I don't know if part of this has to do with the wildfires out west, if that's moving some of our eastern birds maybe a little farther east. Um, yesterday morning, around sunrise, and throughout the whole day, it was pretty hazy in the whole sky, and the sun just stayed orange the whole day. So I don't know if we're seeing some of that smoke and debris 
come this way and maybe it's pushing some birds this way. But it's been a pretty incredible year for red-eyed vireos. Warbling vireos, one, it's starting to taper off right now, and Philadelphia vireo is really starting to pick up. So we kind of hit that point in September. A lot of people can confuse warbling and Philadelphia, and kind of like the timing with Tennessee and orange crown warbler, the sort of this uh, bimodal peak, if you will, where they transition and it's, okay, Tennessee's done and orange crown begins. And we've kind of hit that point now where, okay, warbling vireos almost done and Philadelphia vireos starting to pick up. So that's a good one to keep an eye out for. Still just very, very quiet out here. Just hearing the occasional cardinal, occasional blue jay yelling. Every now and then that soft of a Swainson's thrush. Ryan, this is Betsy. I'd like to yep. ask a question. Go for it. For those of us who are not familiar with this beautiful park, um, can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, how large is it? Um, where is it located in relation to the lakefront? And it looks so beautifully maintained uh, and such a beautiful forest. What can you tell us about it? Yeah. So, I'm going back in my memory here from when I used to work here. Um, I, I want to say, oh, geez, it's about 700 acres, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that. I may be a little, little off on that. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly large park. It's one of um, Ohio State Park's great state parks. You know, I happen to not to toot our own horn, but I love the Ohio State Parks. And that they're free to get into is a blessing for all of us. Um, but Maumee Bay is right on Lake Erie. So when everybody makes their um, exodus to Northwest Ohio for spring, um, it's in the line of McGee Marsh, Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, Metzger Marsh, Howard Marsh, Cedar Point National Wildlife Refuge, and then Maumee Bay State Park. We're all, all our great spots along the lakeshore. Sorry, Robin. Um, so it's right off the lakeshore. And what I find really cool about this spot is it has all these varieties of habitats. So, like I said, we're, in, we're on the horse trail right now, which, as its name implies, is intended for horses. But not too many horses, not too many people actually bring their horses out here. And this area actually tends to be flooded in spring. So if you do come over here, you might want to throw some muck boots on. But it has sort of these forested spots. It has some prairie areas where you can get things like you know, eastern meadowlark, savanna sparrow, um, short-eared owls sometimes will hang out during the winter, finding other scrubbier spots where there will be northern sawwet owls. But then you have tons of marsh habitat as well to get you know, all the good marsh birds, bitterns, egrets, um, wood ducks, blue-winged teal, things like that. I have seen some signs recently of, America, of beaver in the region, so that's really cool. Um, but I like it because you can come here and not within that big of an area, you can hit all these different little habitats. And especially if you're just looking for birds during migration, you can go to the beach, uh, especially now, and go look for shorebirds. There's not a whole lot of shorebirds, or there's not an abundance of shorebirds that show up, but there tends to be great diversity of shorebirds. Crane fly just flew past. Uh, sh diversity of shorebirds that will hang out on the beach. I know red knot we're seeing last week or so, and generally there's dunlin and leaf sandpiper, semi-palmated sandpiper, semi-palmated plover, all hanging out along the beach. So that's why I really like this area, just the variety, the sort of instant gratification, if you will, of getting to a spot and just going, okay, we're here. We see birds right away. 
and the diversity is incredible. Yeah, we're so we're so fortunate, not only just to have the one well, uh, one park, but a whole series of parks along the the lake shore of the these beautiful lakes. Yeah, and getting into what I kind of wanted to go on with, like the holistic nature of migration. Um, you know, here over. Central Ohio, Eastern Ohio, having these areas is just crucial for migration. And it's becoming more and more evident uh, to land managers, researchers, that for birds, it's not about breeding habitat and wintering habitat. Those are two very vital areas for birds. Obviously, we have to have breeding habitat for these birds to breed. And we have to have wintering habitat for them to hang out during the winter and feed up and come back to us. But all these spaces in between, which if you look at a map, cover so much more area that these birds have to travel to. Ooh, finally got a warbler. And it is a black pole warbler. We've got one warbler for the day. Super excited. And then a yellow-bellied flycatcher just came in behind it. <laughs> so having these areas, um, these birds need so much more than just two spots, breeding and wintering. All these little spots in between, and especially with us along Lake Erie, whether it's northwest Ohio, northeast Ohio, central Ohio, this is one of the first spots that these birds get to. And if you're a bird that just crossed the lake or you've just traveled through Canada, maybe you're traveling east like some of these black poles are. Once they hit northwest Ohio, they keep traveling to the Cleveland area. Having great habitat is vital for these wonderful migrants. And I just always get distracted by our dogwood berries. And I picture black poles just coming in and feasting on these. Um, but it's not just just about the birds. We oh, another another yellow-bellied flycatcher. They're making a good little push today, or at least there's quite a few of them around. Um, these areas are great for birds, but I know me personally, I'm not just about birds. I'm about dragonflies and other insects as well. So the more we can conserve and preserve habitats like this we will, one, help the birds. And they're the flashiest, they're the ones we really like, but it's also great for the insects and mammals, reptiles as well. And as much as I like dragonflies, um, once autumn meadowhawks start coming out, I'll see a lot of black poles eating those, and they'll feast on dragonflies as well. So it all really works together uh, between bird and insect and people and you know, as much as it's for them, it's for us too, uh, especially during these times that we've been feeling confined and everything. Getting out into these areas and just experiencing the natural world does so much for our well-being and just having this joy for life still. Well, as I continue to look for the warblers that are hunkered down wherever they are, maybe they buried themselves in the mud to avoid the cold. I don't know. Hopefully not. Um, another group of warblers that I know people tend to get frustrated over, or two warblers in particular, are Tennessee and Orange Crown Warbler. Black poles chipping over in the dogwoods, of course, I can't see them anywhere, but they're there. Um, Tennessee and Orange Crown, another set that get confused a lot. They're both kind of just greenish yellow birds. But when we start to, I think, break them down a little bit more, get over that initial jerk reaction of, oh, I don't know what it is. Is it Orange Crown? Is it Tennessee? Um, again, timing is a really important factor with them. We're really in Tennessee time right now, and usually one of the obvious 
clues between Tennessee and Orange Crown is if it says you or y'all, that was my mild joke for the morning. I don't know if it was that good. But uh, timing is really important. Tennessees kind of go throughout most of all of September and really start petering down once October hits. And Orange Crowns, they're not that common of a bird in the east. Uh, we do get them out here, but they're just generally not that common. So Tennessee's by far way more common. But once October kind of rises and Tennessee falls, that's when Orange Crown does start to pick up in a way. Barn swallow. Starts to pick up, and it could be, it then becomes more common that it could be an Orange Crown warbler. So that's something to consider when being out in the field looking for warblers. Um, but just looking at kind of like Blackpole and Baybreast, Tennessee is a very clean, smooth-looking bird. It tends to be slim-looking. It almost would blend in seamlessly with li willow leaves that are just very thin and green, uh, but kind of white underneath, whitish, particularly near the undertail coverts and the vent, um, but with just a yellow-greenish wash to it, especially above, very just plain greenish yellow and in some instances kind of gives the hint of a small wing bar cardinals yelling at me and orange crown very yellow underneath it might be kind of a dusky yellow but very consistently yellow from sort of breast down through the undertail coverts but it has compared to the Tennessee more streaking um, it might be very blurry, very faint, but it gives it, again, kind of this dirty, like it pushed its breast down, uh, looking for a nice grub on the floor, the ground. It has a sort of dirty look to it. And then flipping over to the top, if you're able to see the top, very more olive green, dusky gray, olive green color compared to Tennessee. Which again, it's going to be more of a bright yellow green. And if we were to look at the face... Tennessee has a pretty obvious dusky eye line going sorry, thrush. Eye line going through the eye and setting off this pale supercilium, pale eyebrow above it, where Orange Crown kind of has a mild hint of a eye line, uh, but has more eye, more obvious eye arcs, and doesn't have that really pale supercilium, pale eyebrow. So it makes its face look pretty plain, and it'd be great if we could see the orange crown, but it stays so well concealed that even when we're banding them, we have to really blow on the head to see those orange feathers and determine if it's male or female. That's the only way in a lot of them, even when you, there is an orange patch there, it's so intermediate that we just say, I don't know, it's an orange crown warbler. Another one that will be making a big insurgence here soon, and it's kind of started already, but really coming into this week and next week, we should see bigger pulses of them, is Magnolia Warbler, one of the other confusing warblers, uh, just in that it kind of looks completely different than it does in spring. Um, males in spring have you know, a nice big black back patch, they are, I, I receive a lot of flack for this, but they are one of the butter butts. They have a yellow rump, and I always get a little upset when people are like, oh, there's a butter butt, and they're talking about yellow rump warbler, and I'm like, well, you know, Magnolia has a yellow rump, Cape May has a yellow rump, Palm Warbler has a yellow rump. But anyway, it's a bright yellow rump as well in spring with great black upper tail coverts and nice blue crown, white facial markings. And then they lose a lot of that in fall and become just kind of yellow and gray and a little much more nondescript compared to their spring plumage. But one good key for them in fall uh, that can be an obvious clue to Magnolia is as soon as they flash that tail, and even if it's closed, you, know, you get a picture, like I'm looking up in this 
maple here and all you get is a picture of a magnolia way up there. Um, if you can see that open tail or even closed tail, that'll have a white bar running through the middle of it. Great clue for magnolia warbler. Uh, they're at least our only eastern warbler that has that feature. Great catbirds. They're kind of hitting their peak as well right now, although they'll go well into mid-October. Ooh. Robins are starting to come down, too, hitting these berries. Uh, but magnolia, if you can get that feature, that's great. Now I'm starting to get distracted by birds flying in all over the place. But if you're looking at magnolia underneath, yellow throughout the throat and face, sometimes hints of black along the breast if it's an older bird. Some young birds kind of have just faint markings along the sides that aren't always obvious, but that yellow from vent to throat, and if you get the shot of the face, has a nice white eye ring on it as well, a different feature than it would have in spring, with just sort of this gray hood enclosing all of that. I think it's maybe 67 degrees or so because the birds are starting to actually pick up a little bit. Oh, Philadelphia Vireo. I wish I could zoom in really well, but I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can make my screen bigger. But believe me when I say there's a Philadelphia Vireo up there, compared to their one that you know a lot of people can mix up with Warbling Vireo, and if you're hearing just their song, Red-Eyed Vireo is another confusing contender. But particularly with warbling vireo, they tend to, warblings can get a little bit of a yellow wash all over their breast, more particularly their sides in fall. And that can be kind of confusing. But Philadelphia, again, in timing, we're more in Philly time right now. Uh, this is also what I call Elton John's bird. But really yellow from throat all through breast. And getting a look at the face much more obvious facial pattern with an eye line going through. Um, and it almost has more of a warbler appearance than it does a vireo appearance. It's very quick, it's small, moves around a little bit more where other vireos can be a little bit slower and more determined in their actions. And I think I've just now started... Ooh, there we go. Also, compared to spring, I know this is a question I get a lot in fall, is when should I start looking for birds in the morning? Um, you know, spring, we obviously start... We're rearing to go at dawn for the dawn chorus, and right when the birds wake up, fall... Birds are a little bit lazier. They don't really have that push to migrate as hard as they do, or as much as they do in spring. So they don't really wake up right away. Uh, it tends to be a little bit colder in fall. And I don't know about you, but I don't really like getting up first thing in the morning and it just being cold and not having like warm coffee. So that's another factor. The insects aren't as active first thing in the morning. So they're really waiting on insect activity. I'm trying to, oh, I think that's a house arrow. Ugh. Um, there are chips coming around here. So usually about hour and a half, two hours after sunrise is really a good time when they first start waking up in the morning to go out and look for them. And then, you know, as the day goes on, they'll be around, but that's a good active time period for them. And as we've kind of seen just walking here and listening into my oohs and ahs, fall warblers kind of tend to flock together, and they form these mixed feeding flocks. And you may go 
you know, 100 feet, not see a single bird, and then all of a sudden you're just run into this patch of dozens of birds all congregating together, all looking for insects and berries all at the same time. And you can just walk into this flurry of activity. So it can be a little frustrating when you're not seeing anything, but then as soon as you pop into one of these little feeding groups, you're bouncing back and forth going, ooh, black pole, ooh, another black pole, ooh, another black pole. Oh, but there's a chestnut-sided warbler, and there's a American red star. And just kind of gives this exhilarating feeling and almost a reminder of spring, but in its, in its own different sense. And just like that, they're already dissipated downy woodpecker. I can they're way up in the trees there. And got a bay breasted warbler. And actually, luckily, one thing I didn't mention with them is I can actually see some of that bay. So that's probably a probably an older male, maybe a young young male. But just having a little bit of that hint of bay is a great clue that it's a bay breasted warbler. If it's not there, doesn't mean it's a black pole. But if it is there Definitely helps your identification. Now they're just sort of really streaming in as much as they can stream on a cold, cloudy day, but about a dozen or so warblers all starting to foot into these upper canopy hanging out in the sycamore. I don't know if I need to say it again, but I just love fall warblers. Fall is just such a great time, and I'm so happy that Western Cuyahoga put on this challenge to get people out and experiencing fall warblers and just fall migration period. I'm sure people aren't just looking for fall warblers. Um, it's just such a great, calm time to look for birds and just enjoy nature. And I know another report I read here, actually I think I just read it this morning before I made my way over to Mommy Bay. Um, um, Black Swamp Bird Observatory's information that we put out um, with our point counts, daily point counts and everything, red breasts and nuthatches have been just everywhere. And I know we started seeing them, I think my first one I recorded was mid, mid-August. Um, I haven't heard one yet here. I heard one in my yard just before I left urban Toledo. Um, but they are just continuing to be everywhere, and hopefully that means we'll have a good red-breasted nuthatch year. I know more so over Cleveland area, northeast Ohio, that they, they do breed out there. At least they've been reported during recent breeding bird surveys and um, the breeding bird Ohio Breeding Bird Atlas, second edition. But with the number that there are, they can't just be coming from that region, especially in our area. So I would expect maybe we'll see a good bumper year of red breasteds this winter, or they might just get here and the rest are already done. They skip us and move to central and southern Ohio. I don't know, but it's at least great to appreciate those little toy tutors right now as they're yanking and yank, yank, yank up in the trees. I don't know if you can hear it through my little headphone microphone, but a red breast just started tooting, just started calling. And 
And for those that might get a little confused with white breast and uh, red breast, I say toy tutor because that's just what it sounds like. It sounds like this little tiny car horn um, that you might have had for a little dollhouse or a little miniature, just this, <laughs> and it just has this cute, sweet little nature to it compared to white breast. It's a little bit more hefty, yank, 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 yank. So now I expect everybody to say Tiny Toy Tutor from now on. So even though um, I know the Warbler Challenge is going on till through October, um, fall migration, we're looking for northerly winds to bring birds in. I know particularly in our region, when we get northeast winds, it tends to be the days that weren't so great to look for warblers. It's generally colder. They seem to just disappear into the ether. Um, but northerly winds will definitely cause some turnover, bring some new birds into the region, especially after we've had days of just straight south winds or east winds or uh, sometimes west winds, um, but so kind of planning ahead, looking at the weather the next day, the next few days, and looking for those days where northwest or north wind may shift uh, would be good days to go out and look. But also, those southerly days and west days are great days for getting out because especially Cleveland area, our area, Toledo area, it pushes birds back up to the lakeshore. And if they're confined to the lakeshore, they don't really have anywhere else to go. Those can be great days to add on to your warbler challenge, but just to get out and see a good number of birds regardless of any kind of number. But on those northerly days, maybe don't hit the lakeshore areas. Try to move a little bit farther inland so you can find some spots. I know I kind of picked this spot at Maumee Bay because it's about a half a mile or so off the lake and wasn't my first choice, but then I saw the wind direction and said, ah, I better move inland a little bit farther to accommodate for that wind. One, it's just colder, makes the lakefront colder, but two, as birds are crossing the lake, they don't drop in immediately. They can, depending on which species, but they can tend to, um, what's the word I want? gently fall down and sort of make a longer deceleration into the habitat. So that could take them, you know, half a mile, mile, two miles farther inland than just straight coming down to the, the lake shore, that dropping in that we think of. Uh, but those northerly wind days, if they're strong, cold, tend to push them in a little bit farther. So you know, a couple miles, few miles inland can be very beneficial for finding warblers and just other songbird migrants, period. And out the field, of course. A little more milky and chillier. The grackles over in this tree don't seem to mind, though. I was wrong. They're all robins. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't tell when it's a bird far away. Well, Betsy, I see that it's about 10 till. Any, oh, I can just barely now see the sun kind of trying to come out a little bit. But uh, any other questions or thoughts? Is there anyone who is here who has a question? Just unmute yourself and ask away. I could probably just go on for 
hours just randomly talking about any of the bird thoughts that pop in my head. But. Well, this is really fun. So it's really it's up to you. Um, it's it's uh, wonderful to see the trail and to hear your your um, your tour. <laughs> Again, I hope, you know, we've been doing some Facebook Lives and whatnot, and I've been kind of surprised by the number of people that have commented or messaged us and just, you know, they're out California or out somewhere else that they, you know, or they have medical issues that they can't get out, and been surprised at that outpouring of love that people have given just to say thank you for, even if you can't really see the birds, through my, you know, tiny camera phone. Uh, thank you for going out and at least showing me the habitat and talking about what's out there. And it's not something I really expected because I always think of like, oh man, you want to see the bird really close. Oh. Of course, I got bird distracted by yellow belly flycatcher. Um, but just surprised at the outpouring of appreciation from people that just can't get out right now and yeah I hope hope this will be able to do that as well for some local folks or even farther out just want to see some nature and habitat while they can't right now well, I absolutely agree with you um, everything that you're doing and showing is just so um, uplifting for people who cannot be there uh, with you on the trail today. Yeah. Little yellow, oh, I just love yellow belly fly catchers. Such cute little lemon drops um, hanging out out there, up there, since he's 20 feet above my head. But another, just to bring up fly catchers, another one people can kind of confuse. Uh, but they just have this really compact nature. Really yellow underneath, sort of green top. They're one of the empids, Empidonax flycatcher. So they're they're confusing to people, understandably. They all look really similar, but that great just yellow wash underneath, yellow eye ring that's pretty obvious and almost has a little bit of a teardrop behind it, and lemony yellow wing bars. Really great little clues for setting them apart from least and alder and willow and the other one that's escaping my brain at the moment. <laughs> Hi Ryan, I have a question. Yeah, go for it Denise. Um, I just recently went to visit my son in New York and did some birding around his pond, and I did come across a Canada warbler. Now, how? Oh. Um, what is their um, migration like? Uh, they come through this area or not seeing it very many? So around here, um, Canada's aren't as prevalent. You get over more into the the mountain mountainous regions of New York and the northeastern states. They actually breed over there, so... Okay. It's not surprising that you saw one over there. Great okay. spot for them. Ohio, you know, they don't breed here. They breed fairly close-ish, but not that close. Uh, so they really pass through in August. And late August, early September, uh, I know me personally, I haven't seen a Canada in probably two weeks. So we're probably, we're definitely past their peak. Yeah, um, there could still be, yeah, there could still be the random bird that comes through um, just because, you know, every bird is an individual and if it doesn't want to leave, it doesn't have to. Uh, but we're, we're past their peak, but there could definitely still be some out there. I would expect it to be younger birds that don't have that nice black necklace, um, but they would still, you know, slate, group, slate gray back and yellow undersides. Yeah, this was um, like Labor Day weekend, so it was pretty a couple weeks ago. So, yeah, that would have been just about peak peak Canada time, <laughs> at right. least in Ohio. Yeah. Okay. And one 
thing to think about or consider. Um, uh, another lease or uh, yellow belly flycatcher. Um, <laughs> the birds in spring, the, at least the warblers, the birds that come later, Canada, Morning, Connecticut, Wilsons, they tend to be the ones that come earlier in fall. So Morning is pretty much past its peak. Canada is pretty much done. Um, Connecticut, they're still moving through if you're lucky enough to find one. Um, Wilsons. They're heading into their peak. They're a little different. They'll go throughout most of September. But Canada morning, a little bit more on the earlier side for us. Okay. Good. Thank you. I'm glad you got to see one, though, because that is one of my favorite warblers. Yeah, there's a lot of pine trees around this pond, and there were there were Cape May warblers all over, and um, I happened across this, this one. I only got a headshot because, <laughs> it's, you know. Hey, that's just, good enough, though. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, cool. That's that's definitely a good fall warbler. That's a good warbler any time. But. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Barely hearing some little wits from swings and thrushes. They also tend to, after they make that little wit sound, kind of do a little partial sound or song. So you'll hear some of that. That's a horrible imitation of what it actually sounds like because it sounds so good. But another, just a great clue for finding swings and thrushes, or at least realizing that they're out there. Oh, hummingbird. Ruby throats are... They're... I'd say they're past their peak right now, but they're still definitely... Still definitely out there. Yeah, rose breasted. A couple of rose breasted above me. If you don't know rose breasted's call, that is a good one to learn. It just sounds like a, a tennis shoe on a gym floor. A gym floor, just a squeaky, I can't even do it, but just a quick squeak, generally from the canopy. Great clue for rose breasted gross beak. And rose breast one people may not realize has a has a basic plumage that it molts into in fall. So males don't have the black and white with that great red triangle on their breast. They look more like females. So you'll just see these sort of brown, warm, caramely, macchiato rose breasted in fall, and they could be male or female. Uh, but if they open up their wings females have yellow wing pits and males have red rosy ring, wing pits. So if they fly away, if you see yellow and say, oh, that was a female rose-breasted, or if you see pinky red, it was a male rose-breasted. All right, Betsy, it is. Oh, man, they're really just filtering, starting to filter through. Well, Betsy, thank you if everybody's ready to go out and start birding on their own now. <laughs> thank you so much, Ryan. This has really been wonderful. And thank you for bringing us along here. on this wonderful morning walk. Yeah, thank you for joining me. I haven't been out here in a little bit, and I just got buzzed by a robin. Um, <laughs> I haven't been out here for a little bit, so it's nice to just get out and talk and look for birds. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, and have a wonderful day. Yeah, you guys too. Thank you very much.
Okay. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.